uh, we have heard so many beautiful things about all the developments happening in the region. Uh, Brasil came out with the new wave of uh, developments that are happening there. And the idea is to basically, with all the collective experiences that you have, and if you can say a bit about it, and what are the next stages, what do we see next? And I think we'll go through that. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for welcoming me here. Um, it's, it's always exciting to see the buzz of the city again with people actually being able to interact with one another in person. So it's, uh, I'm glad we're up and running again. I think for me, given my history, and I've been very privileged to be exposed to this asset class, not just hospitality, but real estate in general, globally. So when I was living in the US, my time in Europe, here in the UAE, both in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and to see the way that it has changed and moved, but that the underlying asset class itself hasn't really been disrupted in, in, in any way, um, is something that I suppose a lot of investors here in the region have a comfort with, right? So we talk in a lot of different forums about technology. We talk in a lot of different forums about what's happening next, what are the new things that are coming online. But still, the investor base here is very comfortable with hospitality, with, with any asset, really, that's in the hospitality space, commercial, residential, so on and so forth. But for me, having spent a lot of time in Abu Dhabi building uh, the investment office, working uh, on the technology side of things, as well as the exposure that I had in Dubai, um, and, and in my current role as, as chairman of ENBD REIT, um, as well as chairman of Khazna, which is the largest data center business in the region, soon to be hopefully the largest data center business globally, um, there's a lot of appetite to still continue to build on what we've already done very well in the region. So, <clears throat> with all your collective experiences and the way things forward and hearing about all these beautiful projects on it, one of the key aspects is where's the money? Yeah. So what do you think about the financial landscape in the region? How do you see GCC evolving as part of that? So there's, there's a lot of rhetoric today when you listen to some of the global experts about what is going to happen uh, to the economy. I think it's very different today compared to where we were in 2007, 8, 9, and by the time that the, the first financial crisis, hopefully the last financial crisis, um, <laughs> impacted us here in the region. I think when I look at the institutionalization of companies, the investor base, the diversification of the investor base today in the region. It's a very different landscape than where it was 15, 16 years ago. And I think that is going to make it much more resilient as it relates to not just the sustainability of that investment into uh, our market and the wider region, but also the availability of diverse buckets of capital whether it be the financial institutions that are willing to lend more, whether it's the uh, various JVs that you're seeing between international investors and regional investors or operators that are looking to develop and deploy new asset classes or expand on the success that is already here in the market, I think we are poised to really take advantage of some of the disruption that's happening in other markets around the world, but the sustainability that we are really achieving here, I think. Now you have a doctorate, and it's an amazing doctorate in uh, labor economics within the region. One of the key aspects of our business and with the audience here is we are all hospitality professionals. Uh, we have a very high-touch business, so we require a lot of people. And the challenge that we face, I think, intrinsically, COVID being what it was, uh, Dubai and the region had a lot of positiveness, I think, thanks to the leadership and the vision, the way it evolved out. But now, with 140,000 keys just opened up or opening up in the last two years from a proper shutdown to why, where we are today, and then you look at Riyadh, Jeddah, Qatar with the World Cup, I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we see. And it's not only a current challenge, it's going to be the challenge for the next couple of years as well. What do you see the risk? What do you see from where to, let's say, to where your doctorate had on? How does it go? There's always a balance between academia and real-world application of what you study. And unfortunately, most of the time, they don't merge in, in <laughs> any way whatsoever. But interestingly, what we have here, even though the region is relatively quite small in terms of the population, we have a very different type of tourist base that comes to the region. 
in, in the kingdom, for example, there's a lot of local tourism, right? And so that's being developed, as well as the, the tourism side of things to attract the foreign uh, tourists. Here in the UAE, for the most part, we focus on foreign tourism into the UAE, but now you're starting to see a lot of initiatives, like in Ras al-Khaimah, like in Hatta, like in various parts of Abu Dhabi, where they are trying to get the residents to also vacation within the UAE. Now, a key part of all of this is obviously going to be how you sustain this level of tourism and the dollars that people are earning in the respective countries that they reside in here in the region and whether or not they have that disposable income to continue to travel within their own country and, and spend. And so this is where I think you're starting to see that diversification in five-star, four-star, three-star experiences that you have and the type of packages that are being sold. Now, our biggest risk in this region, this is my opinion, having looked at the numbers, looked at the data, is unemployment, youth unemployment. Our demographic structure here in the region is very different to the demographic structure in the Western world, uh, in Japan, in other countries, where it's an aging population. 60% yeah. of the population in the Middle East and Africa is under the age of 30. So that's our strength. It's a strength, it's a massive strength, but it's also a risk. However, what countries are doing today to mitigate for that risk is, like the panelists that were up here on stage earlier talking about creating those jobs, creating the opportunities, making sure that the standard of living is not up to par just within the region, but compares on a global level with what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And I think that's going to be um, the telltale sign of success. And I, I want to add one other point. And part of it is to dispel this notion um, of whether Emiratis or Saudis will want to work in this sector. I can tell you without fail, they will work in this sector. But you have to try to attract them in a very different way than you are attracting the other talent that it is that you're bringing into the region. It's very easy to import. It's much harder to grow something within the country that you're in, specifically because of perception. And I think that what you're seeing today with some of the programs that have been launched in Abu Dhabi, where it's about providing exposure, it's about apprenticeships, it's about all of these different initiatives to provide people with visibility about what options they may have. I sit on the board of trustees of UAE University, which is the largest university in the UAE. I can tell you we graduate a lot of students that would love to go into the hospitality industry, but either because of bias or perception, of the lack of opportunity or the unwillingness to work, there is this conflict between that labor pool that's available mm -hmm. that wants to learn versus the ease of just bringing in talent from abroad at every level. Right? I, I do so agree with you. I, I grew up in Oman um, as well as worked in Bahrain. Uh, Saudi has been a big focus in the region for everything that we say. In Oman, um, we have had Omanis working in all level of the business, uh, I would say for the last 15, 20 years. Bahrain, similar story. Saudi, last week I was so impressed where the full life cycle of your journey in the hotel, it's all Saudis. And I think it's the evolution and how you pitch the business to them and not uh, just put a job description in front and say, this is it, and end of story. Uh, and I think it's the career progression for everybody because in the end of the day, it's in their city, in their country. And, and it's a balance, right? Because today, um, I believe and I know that leadership around the region wants to create the right opportunities, wants to train up the talent that is here in our region so that we can take the next level of jobs. Not all of them, but to at least get our foot in the door to be able to train that. And this is going to be an interesting balance as it relates to the adoption of technology, particularly in the hospitality industry when you start looking at that light touch that everyone wants. So every customer wants the best service, but they don't want to interact with anyone, right? I want one point of contact that handles everything for me. Yeah. But there are simple things that you can do in this sector and in this segment where I think you can bridge that lack of technology that exists with a labor pool that is looking for opportunities that doesn't know that this is yet available to them. And I think merging those and the institutions, the holding companies that get that right, are going to be very successful from a sustainability point of view, but also visibility with leadership in the country, which is vital 
to continue t your expansion, your growth, and having a seat at the table and, in that and decision. And that's so true. I think uh, right from the basic, I would say, the procurement cycle of goods and services, the way it you was and the way it is and the way it should be, uh, versus the way even we do our hiring, for example. I think everything is getting more low touch, but definitely the efficiency of the operation, the way the customer journey and experience uh, in one of our previous panels, uh, Fahad, uh, was there, mentioned about the center of our business is the customer and is the journey that you evolve to it and how it goes through is more important than anything you do. Because in the end of the day, if the guest experience, no one is going to worry about who did the journey, but the guest experience is not the best. And I think Dubai is very successful in doing that. And I think there is a progressiveness to it. You asked me a question about capital. Where is the money, right? Show me the money. And I think it's interesting to see where we are in the cycle uh, particular in conversation. So none of this has really been executed yet, but there's a lot of discussions today that I'm having with large real estate institutions, whether they're family offices or sovereigns, where they're looking for uh, a, a mechanism to release capital. They want to participate in the capital markets here, but there are questions around, is a REIT the right way to go about doing things? Um, should it be a fund? Should I keep this private? Um, so on and so forth. My experience has been a challenging one as it relates to uh, REITs in that the mechanism that REITs were created for was a tax pass-through, which has not existed here in the region. Definitely. And I think there's a mismatch sometimes between that expectation that investors have of being able to generate double-digit returns irrespective of the environment and the climate that we're currently in and the reality on the ground in terms of the robustness of competition the sheer supply of not just uh, you know, commercial, residential, or, or hospitality, but quality supply. Yeah. So you are competing on price point, you're competing on product, but you're really competing against how well people had it 15 or 16 years ago, right? And I think this is where that institutionalization and having discussions with the foreign investor base around setting up here is going to really bridge the gap between the local investor uh, expectation and foreign investors' uh, reality in their markets and what they're looking to achieve here. So I think with this, uh, the association plays, uh, acts like a bridge, uh, be it the checks and balances, being the understanding of the mandate or the operation because across regions, across continents, uh, members are doing the same job uh, be it the bandwidth might be different, the scale might be different, it might be, a, it might be a different operational reality, but the crux of it is that they're all doing the same job. So when a REIT comes from Europe, comes into this part of the world, you have uh, members of the association who do the same thing, but in a different way. And that differentiation is where you get your double-digit growth and how you do it. Uh, it is. I, I just want to add a quick point on that. Part of the concern that a lot of the international investor base have, and in all my discussions with them, is about the robustness, the governance, and the institutional um, uh, thresholds that some of the uh, partners that they're looking to work with here have attained. And I think this is going to be an interesting exercise, particularly with the announcement that was made uh, yesterday in Dubai about the family offices, how it is that uh, investors, uh, property owners, so on and so forth, really institutionalize themselves here to be able to attract that foreign capital, not just for their project, but on a partnership level. That yeah. is a discussion of equals. Yeah. And I think our next panel is more or less uh, based on that discussion. Uh, I cannot let you go without talking about digital assets. And I think uh, with the way the markets are evolving, uh, the digital space, uh, we heard about some interesting news on the metaverse, on how things are going, and I think all the operators, we need to start talking about where is my hotel going to look like in the metaverse, because you know, that's a, it's, a, it's a good selling point, but the ground reality, what's happening? Uh, are we seeing the transition of the digital space into the physical space, and vice versa? Uh, are we going to see people actually, in real terms, uh, and ENBD REIT, uh, investing into the digital space and creating that REIT setup there. Uh, is that happening? 
if it does, they'll have to explain it to me because <laughs> I'm still not 100% convinced about some of it. But I think that what it is is that today, again, back to that no touch, you know, no, no communication with a real person. I think that for many years, people have already been living in a digital domain. And I think we are the last generation where we're trying to bridge the gap between the old generation that believes in touching everything and the new generation that doesn't care about culture and everything else that comes the material aspect. The material aspect. And so people don't want to own anything anymore, the younger generation, and the older generation don't want to let go of anything. And so I think moving into the digital domain is going to help both of them be able to bridge that. And I do think that you're going to see a lot of exercises soon, similar to what we were doing with SimCity and other games, but where there's material dollars and dirhams being exchanged in that domain. So what you're saying is that the audience should start investing into... I'm saying I'm going to sit back and watch it for a <laughs> bit before I jump into it. Fair enough. I think on that note, let's do our typical crystal ball. What's next? What do you see next in the market, in the financial world? And I think it also gives me a nice precursor to our next panel as well. Uh, what's happening in this space? What's next? So I think that um, companies, family offices will continue to institutionalize. As they institutionalize, you will see foreign investors come into this market. It's already happening, but it's not happening at the quantum that either of those parties wants it to happen at. You will see regulation start to be put in place that will allow for a more seamless uh, experience between those two partnerships. And more, most importantly, you're seeing the legislative changes and the uh, governance changes at a federal and a local level across the region as it relates to litigation, as it relates to being able to deal with disputes. And I think that is the greatest comfort that both investor bases can derive from this. And so for me, I think that supply will continue to um, expand here. I think that we are already seeing pressure on prices depending on the asset class, but there's still a resiliency in the market. This is one of the only regions that's still open for business yep. in a large way, right? Yep. I traveled to Europe this summer and I can tell you, it's third world as it relates to going through an airport or using public transportation. We're yep. very privileged with what has been built 100%. here, right? So I think that we will continue to build on that momentum. We'll keep attracting the world's best here and we're going to continue to see a growth in that foreign investment in, in the region. Thank you. On that note, let me open the space if you have time for any questions. I've either ah, you were, you were very convincing. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you.